Hey everybody. You awake? Yep. Something that we have to do before before I start it, I need to get a selfie. So I need everybody to show a little bit of energy in the background because I'm gonna send this to my wife today um, for when she wakes up. So ready? Everybody? Woo! Alright. There we go. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, Turn off my ringer, make sure. Um, you can tweet at Jeff Dodges if you want to follow me, um, or send me an email if you feel like it. Um, and I'm going to start by telling um, a story, first and foremost, and then I'll get into um, a presentation in a bit. Uh, it's important that every presentation has cute, cuddly animals in it, so I've included, cute, included some cute, cuddly animals because it's, 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 it's how we start, start the day. Um, with badass lasers! Woo! Okay. <laughs> I'd like to share the story about how we started a company that I founded, uh, co-founded 24 years ago. Um, it's a company called Razorfish. You may have heard of it, uh, you may not have. But uh, it, it started you know, in New York City. But I'm gonna rewind back a little further from that point in time. Because before there was digital, before there was mobile phones, before there was all the stuff that we're all here for today, uh, there wasn't any of that, right? I mean, there wasn't an internet. There wasn't mobile phones. We didn't connect with each other the seamless way that we did. So how does a person like me sort of arrive where we are today? So I'm gonna tell a little bit of that story. I grew up in a family with six brothers and sisters. So I have five brothers and a sister. There's seven of us, and I'm the youngest. And as I was growing up through high school in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is where I'm from in the United States, uh, I found myself getting involved in every form of media. I was a DJ. I was a producer at the high school television station. I was a writer. I was the editor of the high school yearbook. I was the photo editor of the high school literary arts magazine. And I was in every single musical theater and dance production that we had in school. I found myself actively interested in every form of expression of ideas. Now, you'll have to think about it back then, and many of you here may remember that, and many of you may not. But the media landscape at the time was highly fragmented. So publishing magazines or newspapers had the mechanism for publishing, which is printing presses, writers, um, the, the effect of monetizing that was by selling ads on that platform, uh, and then you distributed those magazines with trucks um, all around wherever the, the distribution points were. Same thing with newspapers. Television had a different setup, and cable TV was relatively new. So you had television stations with expensive uh, uh, equipment that you needed to to capture the media and then to distribute the media. Cable TV, the same thing. Go on and on. Radio, the same thing. Each form of media had its own form of production, distribution, and monetization form. It was highly fragmented. And that's the media landscape that I grew up in. I grew up in an environment where I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I wanted to be in that world. But all of those worlds were fragmented. Again, production, distribution, and monetization all happened with separate sales forces, separate infrastructure, and separate organizations. As that landscape began to converge in the late 80s and 90s, big media companies started to become conglomerates. You started to see newspapers, newspaper companies get bigger and bigger and bigger. Television station companies get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, each form of media began to uh, uh, aggregate for size and for scale and for economies of scale. And that allowed you to sell more ads across more properties. That allowed you to reduce the cost of production and distribution by consolidating factories and, and, and distribution plants. And so that was the sort of emerging of this now consolidated media landscape that we see today. In 1990, I don't know, it was late 80s, I got a Prodigy account. I don't know, does anybody remember the online service Prodigy? There was an online service called Prodigy, there was another one called CompuServe, and then there was a new upstart called AOL. Anybody know of the service AOL? It was okay. You've got mail. 
Um, and these online services fascinated me. I got my first Apple II computer, I then got a small IBM PC Junior, and then I, I, was, I was beginning my sort of uh, rudimentary hacking career in, in my early years in college. I was a classical ballet major. I majored in classical ballet. I then um, went on to, to experience the, the theater. I, I, I was in a B-horror film where, where I get my spine ripped out by the alien in the first 22 minutes of the movie. Um, super exciting. You can look it up online. Um, and so you can start to see this, this, this trend emerge where I'm experimenting and trying things. I'm, 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 I'm experimenting with different forms of expressions, different forms of ideas. And then in 1994, 1993, I bumped into a colleague, a friend of mine, his name was Craig Cameron, and he was, I've known him since I was three years old, he was always the guy in um, elementary school and in, and in um, high school who took college math at the university, he had to leave the school and take a special bus and go to the university to take math. So he was a total, complete, you know, in the truest sense of the word, a nerd. And Craig and I were friends in high school, and then he went off to college, and I went off to college, and I didn't see him for a while. And then I bump into him on the street in New York City. And he's got long hair, and he's got these cool rings on his fingers, and he's wearing this cool army jacket, and I'm like, Craig, what, what's going on? How, what, 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 what happened? Well, you know, and he said, well, I've been at MIT, and I've been working on this thing, DARPAnet, and um, there's this thing called a browser, HTTP colon protocols, and I've been spending some time also working for a company called Bull Baronek and Newman, doing communication protocols for the Army for tank simulators to help weapons talk to each other, and I was like, whoa, dude, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and I said, but do you want to go get a cup of coffee? I haven't seen you in a long time. You know, and he said, yeah, let's go get a cup of coffee. So we went to a diner in New York City, we had a cup of coffee, and we started talking about all the things that we had done. I'm telling him about my spine getting ripped out from the alien in the movie, and he's telling me about the tank simulation protocols that he's writing, um, working on DARPAnet. And I started thinking to myself, you know, this thing, this connected set of computers that he's working on, my experience with, with, with my early online services, th this could be something. And so Craig then said, hey, why don't we go to my house? I'm going to show you some stuff. And he opened up a computer and he pulled up a browser, the first uh, Mosaic browser. Does anybody ever remember from Mosaic? Yes, okay, we got a couple of old school people in the house. Mosaic was uh, a, a, a program created by Mark Andreessen. Some of you may know the name. And that program allowed you to view the files on different computers in a visual way through what's called a browser. Now we all know what a browser is today, but there wasn't a browser before. And Craig said, I've got this browser and I'm gonna pull up something. He dials in, he types in some code, and up pops a picture of his head on a woman's body. And I said, Craig, what is this? He said, it's a picture of my head on a woman's body. I said, yeah, I know that, but, but what is it? He said, these are pictures that I have stored on my computer at MIT, and I'm calling them up via this thing called a browser on the open internet. And I said, you know, I don't know what you're talking about, but this right here, this is gonna change the world. What I'm seeing right now is gonna transform everything we know today in society. I said, and I wanna start a business with you right now. And he said, what do you mean? I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I said, no, 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 this, this is it. And he said, what do you mean? I said, this is it. This is the thing that's going to transform communications, commerce, services. Everything we do is going to change because of this. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, do me a favor. Let's start a business. You can have all the money. You can have all the money from the business until you think that I'm worth 50%. And at the time at which you think I'm worth 50%, we'll be partners 50-50, but in the meantime, you can have everything. So he said to me, wow, that seems like a great idea. I mean, it's a no-lose situation, right? I said, yeah, let's do it. So 
we started thinking about what this business might be, and in the meantime, I had some contacts, we had some contacts at Time Warner at the time, it was called Time Warner, and I immediately brought home, two weeks later, our first contract for $20,000 building the Time Warner Pathfinder website. And that was our first engagement with Razorfish. We went on to create the first banner ad ever, um, you can look it up, um, it was an AT&T ad, um, and, we, and we quickly grew that business. And I'll tell you how, how quickly we grew it. The first year we did a million two in a million US dollars in revenue, a million two US dollars in revenue. The second year we did 3.5 million US dollars in revenue. The third year, 12.5 million US dollars in revenue. 36 million US dollars in revenue. 120 million dollars in revenue. 256 million dollars in revenue, and the company continued to grow dramatically. It was unbelievable. It was two of us in my bedroom or in my kitchen when we first started working on this. And very quickly, over um, a six year period, we grew the company to 2,200 employees in 15 cities in nine countries. We took the company public in 1999 on the NASDAQ exchange. We issued shares publicly. We raised, I think, $55 million um, with a market cap of $300 million. And boy, was that time exciting. You guys have all heard about it, the dot-com bubble, right? Everything was go, go internet. Everybody was getting on the internet, and it was super exciting. We were you know, being asked to come work with Cameron Diaz and Ben Affleck and Michael Stipe and build out their websites. And we were being asked to travel all around the world and speak at amazing conferences like this. And, all of a sudden, Craig and I became sort of the poster boys for the 1990s internet. We were the internet boys, and it was so exciting. The market cap from the company quickly grew. I acquired 27 companies over the period that we, the first six years of the company's life. We had offices in London, and in San Francisco, and in Tokyo, and in LA, and in Hamburg, and in Helsinki, and in Oslo, and in all around the world. It was super exciting. And the stock market kept going up. So Razorfish's market cap grew from 300 million to a billion two in market cap. Holy moly, the first New York unicorn was Razorfish. Oh my gosh. The newspapers are calling, the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, everybody wants us on TV. We're on the covers of magazines. It's so exciting. Can you imagine it? Pinch yourself. This is the internet revolution at the, at the beginnings. Everything is changing. People are, are, are Amazon emerges. Um, Google hasn't yet come on the scene yet. All of a sudden, we acquire another company in Boston called IQ. We paid over a billion dollars for it. And the company grew from a $3 billion market cap to a $6 billion market cap. Holy moly. The stock that was started out um, at $13 a share was worth $130 a share. We were rich. Unbelievable. In just such a short period of time, we were these two guys that met in a coffee shop in New York City, and now all of a sudden it's crazy, right? Six billion dollar market cap, driving around, amazing stuff going on, right? A few months later, the stock market crashed. We went from internet heroes to internet goats. It was an incredibly humbling experience for me. What was worth $130 a share became worth $1.30 a share. What you thought was rich and exciting became people who lost their money in the stock market giving us death threats. People vandalizing our cars and our apartments. People threatening my family. The internet message boards were all lit with how terrible a person I was and how terrible a person Craig was for proposing that this internet thing was a revolution, when in fact, it was just a fraud. The internet guys were a fraud. It wasn't real. There was no internet revolution. Mobile phones weren't gonna change everybody's lives. It was a very sad time, and I felt immensely humble, but also incredibly sad about this thing that we had built, all these employees that we had, and all the promise of the digital future, and yet here it was, everybody, the newspapers, the news magazine, everybody was laughing at us 
because it wasn't true. The internet wasn't going to change things. Well, the, the World Trade Centers went down in 2001, and America started thinking about things in a different way, and I decided to take some time off. We also decided to take the company private and retool it. We uh, ended up merging the company in with a company called the SBI, and then merging that company in with a company called the Quantive. Just a few years later, I'll get to that story, we sold the company to Microsoft for $6 billion. Amazing. And subsequently, Microsoft spun the Razorfish part of it out and sold it to Publicis, where it sits today. And it now has 12,000 employees in 70 cities with a billion to an annual revenue and is now 24 years old and is considered one of the few companies, if not the only company, lasting that full 24 years, almost a quarter century period, from the beginnings in that, the humble beginnings in that coffee shop to where it is today. But a lot of things happen along the way. One, and I'll make the dates a little bit off, but Google emerged. You know, Google started in the late 90s and really emerged as a public company, I think in 2001. So search and paid search advertising really didn't exist until, you know, after the dot com. And then you saw new things emerge, you know, after that. Um, the iPhone, 2007, you know, 10 years ago, but still much long after, you know, the, the dot com level. And I can keep going, but as you start to see new companies emerge out of the rubble of the crushed dot-com bubble, you started to see that the truth about the internet revolution and the truth about the power of this thing that you were all here doing, these mobile phones that we all carry around, this browser that you all log into each and every day wherever you are, that the internet revolution is real and it's transforming every single thing we touch. Every single aspect of every part of society is going to be touched by the internet and by mobile. And you're here today to celebrate the practitioners who are doing the most amazing work you know, in this world. So take a moment for a second and pinch yourself. You've got the opportunity now to change the world you're about to embark on the next level of journey, that all of that stuff has led to this very moment where you're about to now go back to work maybe later today and get back to doing what you do. And remember that what you do is heroic. What you do is revolutionary. What you do is powerful. And what you do touches people's lives in ways you can't imagine. Respect that power. Respect that truth and embrace what you've got ahead of you because we are looking at the biggest opportunity we've ever seen in the history of mankind to transform the lives of people around the world. And you're here doing it. So with that, I'm gonna start my presentation. Let's do it, right? All right. So as everybody here knows, brand marketing is about authentic engagement, right? Marketers spend a ton of money. This year, I think the, 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 the amount of money spent in, in marketing broadly worldwide is going to be about a, a trillion dollars. One trillion US dollars spent this year in marketing. Most of it's mass communications, the fragmented media types that I talked about before. Uh, TV, print, and radio. It's about $550 billion. And the Indian market is poised to take its share of it, about growing at about 15% this year, which is a blistering pace compared to the 5 to 7% growth in some other categories, or even 2 or 1% in some other regions. Um, this year will be the first year that the Indian market places in the top 10 ad markets worldwide. Exciting. About 230 billion of that annually is spent on digital marketing, most of it in paid search. Some of it in you know, digital display, and then the rest of it in everything else. You got that? But the media landscape has changed, and let's find out. How many in the room have read a real newspaper in the last week? And we got about 20%. How many in the room have read a magazine in the last month, not at the airport? 
and 6%. How many in this room have listened to a radio ad? Less than half in the last month. How many of you have uh, cable television or satellite television? Okay. About half, more than half. Um, how many of you have a mobile phone? Everybody, right? How many of you have a Facebook account? Everybody. How many of you have a Twitter account? Almost everybody. How many of you have an Instagram account? Almost everybody. Almost everybody. You did not be here. <laughs> okay. So if 550 billion, wait, let's, let's just keep the survey going. How many of you have read ratings and reviews on some product before you bought something? Or before you went to a movie? Right? Or before you took a trip? Okay, so almost everybody in the room has listened to the ratings and reviews of people like you and me to make purchase decisions. Okay. So the media landscape is shifting. When you looked at the numbers that I just posted, $550 billion spent annually on major measured media, and yet less than half the people in here are consuming that media, and yet only $250 billion spent annually on digital media, and more importantly on the things that influence purchase decisions, why is there a mismatch and where is all that money gonna go? Right? We're gonna start to see a shift from that $550 billion in measured media move into digital, and that's what's exciting. Social platforms have transformed brand marketing. Now I want to talk about brand marketing versus performance marketing because brand marketing is at the top of the funnel where we, where we drive intent and performance marketing is at the bottom of the funnel where we drive commerce, right? And as you start to think about social platforms, brand marketing is getting transformed today from what in essence was a broadcast medium where I talk at you to an engagement medium where we're all thinking about the same things and working on it together. And just so you know, 67% of shoppers spend more online after recommendations from online peers and communities and friends. And 38% increase their store purchase as a result of earned media exposure. So it's not a fraud or a fake. This stuff is driving purchase decisions. So when we think about how brands are built in the future, it's not gonna be about mass media campaigns talking at people to drive awareness. It's gonna be about social connected digital engagement that's driving brand awareness and then converting to the bottom of the phone. Social marketing is ideal for brand marketing at scale in a digital marketer's world. Think about that. Social helps you engage at scale in a digital brand marketer's world. As you all know, there are now almost 2 billion people on Facebook an audience with massive scale. There's no audience pool more rich and more scale advantage than social. 300 million photos uploaded every day, 5 billion pieces of content shared every day, 20 to 30 minutes spent on the platform each day on Facebook, 1.2 billion WhatsApp users, 50 billion messages a day, 700 million Instagram users, and on and on and on. We've never seen a data platform like this. And it's data on a massive scale. With 300 million, 330 Twitter users, there are 500 million tweets sent every single day. 500 million. And it's authentic pieces of content. This isn't advertising and brand messages. This is authentic things that are shared each and every day by you and I. Here's a picture of Lulu Dog, my dog. She's cute. She's also wet. Um, but when I share a picture of Lulu Dog on Instagram, what does that say about me? It says I'm a dog owner. It says I might be buying dog food every single day. I might be taking the dog to the vet. It tells a lot about me with authentic, transparent, and trusted engagement with stories of my life. So scale, data, and a social medium creates opportunities and insights 
for engagement. Scale, data, and social create opportunities for insights and engagement, but drive exponential business value. It's not just about getting tweets, it's about driving exponential business value. Brand awareness, brand love, brand mindshare, and brand advocacy are all possible at scale in social. But how? Well, social marketing platforms allow you to try to organize and engage, but only, with only a handful of teammates on your team, it's difficult to get true scale with an audience of millions. There's got to be another approach. So to engage at scale, I want to suggest that you create efforts to engage all of your constituents to extend your reach. First of all, organize your employees. Let's get customer support engaged. Let's get marketing engaged. Let's get the product teams engaged. Let's get senior leadership engaged on bringing your message to the, to the world. Then coordinate your partners. Partners, vendors, distributors, contractors, all can be out there extending your brand message into the marketplace. Then act activate your advocates, customers, potential customers, influencers, fans, and the press and media all can activate you know, this audience. So now thinking about your audience as not just, or as your beginnings of activators, not just as your potential customers, but think about it as all the employees of your organization, all of the leadership of your organization, all of your contractors, distributors, partners, vendors, customers, potential customers, fans, and media, all of them can begin to act as your advocates. And that's how you begin to engage at scale. You give those people the trusted, authentic, and transparent values of your brand and allow them to do the work for you. And then you use paid media and owned media to amplify the authentic, trusted, and transparent brand messaging that's occurring in the marketplace from your most rabid fans and customers. This is how engagement at scale and brand building in the digital future is going to be done. And this is the task all of you have, is to come up with programs, not campaigns, but programs that activate all of the constituents of your organization to together work to build your brand with your brand values, with trusted, authentic, and transparent content that comes from engaging with your brand each and every day. Woo! And actually, just to say, you know, your customers and your advocates, they're better marketers than you are. They're better than you think. People are more likely to trust the academics, experts, people like you or employees at the company more than a CEO or more than um, your brand marketing messages. 67% of shoppers online spend more after being recommended by the online community. So it's driving results. Customers accessing an online store after a social media site are 10 times more likely to purchase. 10 times. Where can you get amplification like that in any other form of media? Users are 10 times more likely to purchase. 78% of internet users consider consumer recommendations to be the most credible form of advertising. You all just said it. You all have looked at sites to find recommendations, ratings, and reviews prior to buying something. Fans spend $72 more than on products than non-fans. And people who buy, who follow brands on Facebook are 51% more likely to buy a product post-connection and 60% more likely to recommend a product post-connection. So this stuff works. It's a fact. People who follow brands on Twitter are 67 more likely to buy a product, 79% more likely. So you see that social platforms and advocacy-based engagement marketing to build your brand is a powerful way to think about marketing in the future. I'll leave you with this closing thought. We have to stop thinking about mass communications. And we have to start thinking about how we empower and activate the mass of communicators. And that's going to leave us with a positive future. You all are the future.
you're all seizing that opportunity right now. And I want to thank you for taking the time and thank our sponsors and thank you for the event organizers for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. You know, before I let you go with your permission, if we can just take the next five minutes to see if we have a couple of questions, if that's okay with you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I believe we have mics floating around. So if you have a question, please do raise your hand. We'll ensure the mic reaches you. Do identify yourself and the company you represent before you can ask your question. Yeah, we're just soaking in it. I'll be available in the breaks for questions too if you have to. Does anyone? 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 Okay, no. yeah, we have a lady there to the left. Can we have a mic reach up, please? Yes, right. Shout Jeff, thank you indeed for the talk. I'll uh, basically try and keep the question as concise as possible. Sure. Uh, you talked about creating a group of advocates and then activating them by paying money to literally get people who are authentic, reach out at scale to others. Um, that was what I got out of it. The question in my mind was how does one do that and how does one measure that? So, I, I would just for clarity's sake, um, what you want to do is create programs that activate advocates, not pay. Um, any, anybody who you're paying, in essence, um, isn't authentic or transparent or trusted. Um, they have to advocate because they love your product. They have to advocate because of the service that you're offering them. They have to advocate because your product is touching their lives. Let me just say, if your product doesn't do that, if it doesn't touch people's lives, if it doesn't make them happy, or if you're not engaging in a quality product person relationship, you're not going to win that battle. That's something that you're not going to be able to do well because if your product sucks, there's no advocacy that's going to happen that's going to be good for you. And you've seen this with some of the airlines. I don't know if you noticed in the US, but some of the airlines have had bad experiences with customers. And people have tweeted out negative advocacy for those products. The, the idea is to, is to empower those individuals with some form of program or campaign to allow them with um, assets to, to arm them so that they can advocate on their behalf. Then when those tweets occur, or those Instagram posts occur, or when those um, amplifications occur naturally, Marketers can take those voices and pay to amplify them, right? And that's what I was referring to. So take those trusted, authentic uh, tweets and, and uh, Instagram posts and Facebook posts in the marketplace that are living wild and use those as your now new paid marketing. Does that make sense? Anyone else? Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Shout out. Yeah, hi. Uh, very inspiring uh, session from you, Jim. And uh, I represent uh, uh, the largest regional uh, media brand for the local state of Maharashtra, which is Lokpal. So my question to you is, how would machine learning uh, properly redefine uh, marketing and engaging with brands in the future? So machine learning is going to have a massive role in the future of marketing. As you start to see 300, 500 million tweets a day, all of that is really some expression of, of interest, of brand preference, or you know, there's stuff about people's lives, but there's also a ton of data out there. If you're not a marketer that's analyzing all of that data and using machine learning algorithms and clustering algorithms to aggregate that data, to create taxonomies, and then to automate the process of creating programmatic you know, amplification of some of that information, then you're really missing some of the power um, of what's out there. So we can do some of that manually today, but machine learning algorithms are going to be driving the automation of this brand advocacy at scale. We're going to be taking the voices of the marketplace, we're going to be aggregating them, we're going to be putting them into silos, and then we're going to be taking the output of that and paying to amplify that so that there's trusted uh, voice in the market from our users or from our, 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 our advocates, but we're doing so on a massive scale with machine learning algorithms. That to me is really one of the most exciting opportunities in marketers today, in marketing today. Thank you. All right, we have time for just one more question. All right. Are 
right one right there. We do? Oh, yes, that one. That could be the last one. Hi, Jeff. Hi. You spoke about this dot com fiasco which happened. <laughs> Can you just throw some light on what made you going and create such a wonderful Especially that period when you were down and you also spoke about your family were also threatened. Throw some light on what? I missed that. So, what is that which made you still stick to your idea and continue to make this wonderful company as a fish? Especially that time when you were down. Yeah. Dot com fiasco. So, the dot com bubble was built off of um, stock promoters, banks, basically taking crappy companies and taking them public. So we had good companies like ours, which were profitable and growing fast and making revenue and making profits and employing thousands of people. Then you had bad companies that were just nothing, that were concepts or, 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 or didn't really exist. And the bankers mixed our good companies on the stock market with all the bad companies on the stock market. And eventually, people realized that a lot of what was getting put into the stock market was, was not good. And so when they started selling those companies, they also said, well, maybe Razorfish is in that group too, and so we're going to sell that. Um, and so we always knew in our souls that the company we created was going to be a great one, and that the work that we were doing was meaningful, and that it had power in the marketplace, despite what everybody else was saying. And so, you know, I think from that experience, embracing a tremendous amount of humility, um, finding Herculean amounts of gratitude for all the opportunities that we have ahead of us has given me the ability, humility and gratitude has given me the ability to think through that time, stay focused on the things that matter, my family, my children, um, my employees, working hard, um, building and building and building, despite what everybody else was saying, and driving that humility and gratitude into everything that I do now going forward. And that, for me, really was such a blessing. Um, and that's really what I think helps at, when times are tough and when the, when the road is rough. It's a sense of profound gratitude that allows you to find the strength to move forward and keep building. Uh, thank you.